Love and money, two of the most powerful motivators of human behavior. Whether it's property or money, these two things are She saw all the financial possibilities there, I believe. Which one is more important to your partner? She killed a very good, hard-working, loving man and father of two children for money. How to spot the early warning signs of the gold digger. As a former FBI profiler, I'm often asked, can you spot a killer? Is it a look? An attitude? A pattern of behavior? After 40 years experience, I can say it's complicated. But there's one thing I know. There is a deadly type. Celeste Beard once lived the good life, thanks to her millionaire husband, Stephen Beard. His wife of 40 years had recently passed away, and she was barely in the ground when Celeste moved in on Stephen and in with Stephen. She couldn't wait to get her hands on his money. These days, Celeste leads a far simpler life in a Texas prison cell. When I met her back in 2011, she straight up admitted to me that her fourth marriage to Stephen was a business deal, one that Stephen will not survive. Steve was quite a bit older than you. He was 40 years older. Since I was 18, I had always dated older men, just um, the sex thing, you know, because... What do you mean, the sex thing? I don't know. It just wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't, like, expected, you know. So there so wasn't met. the sexual pressure with older men that there was with younger men? Yes. And that was okay with you? Yes. In 1993, 68-year-old Stephen Beard is a wealthy, retired TV executive whose wife just died of cancer. Celeste is a waitress at his country club. About 10 days after she died, I ended up moving in with Stephen. That's pretty fast. What was the reason for that? Because we were a couple. Stephen lavishes her with expensive jewelry. After three failed marriages, Celeste knows an opportunity when she sees one. For some people, that momentary little rush of buying something, it can become habitual. Oh, I was habitual. <laughs> the way I spent money wasn't that big of a deal to Stephen, like everybody thinks it was. Stephen was extravagant himself. Okay. All right. Of course it was his money. Yes. When you entered the marriage with Stephen Beard on February 18th, 1995, what property or money did you think was the marriage? Nothing. Celeste is a gold digger, pure and simple. She drew a bead on an older man who was very vulnerable. Were you in love? Not at first. We had a deal. What was the deal? he was going to adopt the twins. Celeste has twin girls from a previous marriage. It's a big deal for a man to adopt two children. Why do you think he did that? I don't want to say forced, but I did. I forced him to and do that. what was the reason for that? Because I wanted my daughters to inherit with Stephen's other three children. 
In return, Celeste claims she lets Stephen control her life. That, uh, you know, I'm his. I let him have my hair cut off. I did everything that he wanted me to do. <laughs> and I was going to keep my end of the bargain. Stephen is going to be their meal ticket for the rest of their lives. And what a life Celeste has in mind. Our trip from Germany to London was $60,000, and that was just for the limousine. Spending can be a powerful addiction, and it can ruin lives. And that's what Celeste was all about. Spending made her feel good. And for someone like that, there's never enough. Her new husband gives Celeste $35,000 a month allowance. But even that isn't nearly enough to cover her shopping and partying. But Stephen's love has its limits, and he threatens to cancel her credit cards. Celeste and her daughter's financial futures suddenly look very shaky. But there is a lifeline. Celeste stands to inherit a hefty share of Stephen's multi-million dollar fortune in the event of his demise. At 3 a.m. on October 2nd, 1999, paramedics receive a frightening call from Stephen. Stephen has been blasted in the abdomen with a 20 gauge shotgun. A spent shell is found on the bedroom floor. While he fights for his life in the hospital, police trace the shell to Celeste's close friend. 42-year-old Tracy Tarleton. What was the nature of the relationship with Tracy Tarleton spring of 1990? I brought her into our life. Mm -hmm. Why did you befriend her? I felt like she needed me. Tracy is openly gay, and it's widely rumored that she and Celeste are more than just friends. Did you ever have any romantic involvement with Tracy Tarleton? Yes, Did you have any kind of intimate physical relationship with Tracy Tarleton? No. Celeste claims Tracy was infatuated with her and shot Stephen out of jealousy. She became really obsessed with me. She was acting like a, a boyfriend that you know, you're trying to break off with. Four months after the shooting, Stephen dies from an infection, and Tracy is charged with murder. After Tracy was arrested, she remained silent and would not cooperate with police or prosecutors. Almost immediately prior to Tracy going to her trial, a jail guard handed her a newspaper, said, hey, here's your girlfriend. And on the front page of a Dallas newspaper was a picture of the now infamous Celeste Beard, who had just gotten married to her fifth husband. Tracy went crazy. Tracy finally says something to the detectives and prosecutors she'd never said before. What was it? She said, I asked her to shoot Stephen. She found out that I had remarried again. And after she finds out you'd remarried, then she starts telling prosecutors, you put her up to it. Yes. Tracy shot Stephen because Celeste wanted her to. Tracy was in love with Celeste and thought, wrongly, Celeste loved her. When Tracy realizes she's been played for a fool, she turns on Celeste. Her damning testimony earns her a reduced sentence, and in 2011, she's released from prison after serving only 10 years. Celeste is sentenced to life. That deal with Steve didn't work out, 
Even her kids, whom she wanted to shower with Steve's money, turned against her and even testified against her at trial. Do you still see the girls? No. Have you seen them since then? No. That's a lot to deal with. Well, at first, uh, I had a lot of anger because of the way they betrayed me. Did they eventually inherit a lot of money? Yes, millions. Millions. Is there anything you'd like to say to them? <laughs> that I'm sorry that I wasn't the mother they needed. Celeste isn't the first young woman to secure her financial future by marrying an older man. It's a cottage industry, but anyone doing that has to think about the possibility of what will happen if things turn sour. You don't have to be old or very rich to become a target, as Andy Sagata found out. In 1979 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Andy, a university graduate, has the world at his feet. By the age of 25, he was a civil engineer, so he was a go-getter. Andy's sister, Sue Chisholm, remembers a kind, successful young man helping her find her way at the university. He was there for me the first day that I arrived to show me the ropes of the university. He took me to all my classes. Andy's quite a catch, and 21-year-old student Lisa Baca wants to reel him in. She walked into the room, and you knew she was there. Just, hey, look at me. You, you notice the way she dressed, the way she just carried herself. I'd like to be the center of attention, definitely. After a whirlwind romance, in just a few months, Andy and Lisa are married. He just showed her off, you know. He was very much in love with her, I thought. Which was OK for me, you know. I would accept her, too, if that's what he wanted. But it's not long before Lisa is demanding all of Andy's attention. All of a sudden, she's in the picture. And then he kind of started shying away. He wasn't going home to visit as much after he met her. And I was actually over to his apartment twice and only let in once. And it was because she wasn't there. This sets off an alarm in Sue's head. When a person starts isolating their partner from his friends and family so quickly, something bad is probably going down. Of course, we don't have to love the in-laws, but blocking them out completely is a danger sign. There was one time I called him, and I, I said, how you do? And he goes, well, not great. Lisa's being unpredictable. I emptied out the dishwasher, and when she came home, it wasn't done right, so she took all the dishes out of the cupboard and threw them at him. And I said, why don't you just leave her? And he said, I couldn't do that to mom and dad. Family honor keeps Andy from seeking a divorce. But after just nine months of marriage, they agree to a trial separation. In quick time, Lisa takes a lover, bodybuilder David Mead. She needs his muscle for her gold-digging plan. I think the plan was to murder my brother for the money, because he had just taken out the $180,000 life insurance policy. Lisa orchestrates a reconciliation with Andy and moves back into the marital home. Andy's thrilled. He has no idea just how far Lisa will go to get what she wants. There's a knock at my door, and I went down, and it was my brother Ed and a chaplain from the police department. They didn't have to say a word. I knew. I knew. On March 30th, 1980, Lisa Sagata lures her husband to his office after hours. As they leave, a masked assailant attacks with a knife. He was in the Green Berets, so he was trained. The man is Lisa's boyfriend, David Mead, and he's underestimated his victim. 
Andy fights back. The coroner said that my brother stabbed him first. And then David freaked out and started just going at a frenzy. Lisa runs for help, making sure to take long enough for her accomplice to get away. She was running around trying to figure out where to go to call somebody, but she knew what she was doing. Lisa returns expecting to find her dead husband, but her lover is also lying there. David has been seriously injured during the fight. I believe she was just in shock. Her story of a random attack is blown. Lisa quickly shifts to plan B and claims David is a jealous ex-lover who acted alone. She's already processing what comes next and how is she gonna save herself? It was all about her. She had to take care of herself. Lisa is preparing to collect her husband's life insurance payout, but her gold digger dream is doomed from the start. The police soon discover the killer couple is seen buying the murder weapon. Lisa and David were together, and they bought it, and the clerk thought it was weird. David is convicted of second-degree murder and gets 12 years. Lisa gets 16 years for second-degree murder and solicitation to commit murder. His birthday was yesterday. He would have been 64. I missed all those years. She stole. Who knows what we could have had with him. She took him away from us. Lisa was in a big hurry to kill her husband. The ink on the marriage certificate wasn't even dry when she put her plan in motion. If you care about money that much, you could be a danger to society and certainly won't make a kind and loving partner. In the case of Jacqueline Crimple, marriage and motherhood meant less to her than money. Rich Hill, Northern Ireland, June 20th, 2004, Jacqueline Crimble makes a desperate emergency call. Intruders have tied her up and kidnapped her 35-year-old husband, Paul. His best friend, Jim McFarlane, describes him as a gentle soul without an enemy in the world. Paul never had anything bad to say about anybody. That's one thing about his character. He always had that, always seen the good side of people. Just two years earlier, Paul and Jacqueline and their young son and daughter moved to the small country village. Jacqueline soon earns a reputation, a bad one. Jacqueline was always wanting to be center of attention and um, always the loudest voice in the room. She's gone out every other weekend by herself. He's at home babysitting the kids and stuff. Paul is one of the few people in the village who does not know his wife has taken a young lover, 27-year-old Roger Ferguson. Paul was more naive with girls and stuff, you know. He would and always tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. So that combined with her overpowering personality, if it wasn't balanced, you know, she was too strong a character for him. Jacqueline isn't just unfaithful to Paul. She openly jokes about cashing in his $450,000 in life insurance policies. A few times Jacqueline had said to Paul in front of people, you're worth more to me dead than alive. But nobody took it seriously because we knew, like obviously Paul had insurance policies and he had a good job, which had insurance as well. But you just assume it's her trying to be the center of attention again. When you hear somebody repeatedly talking about killing another person, you've got to do something about it. You've got to report it. Unfortunately, a life insurance payout gives people like Jacqueline Crimble deadly ideas. They see their partners as bank accounts just waiting to be drained. On June 19, 2004, the night before Father's Day, Jacqueline is being unusually attentive. She books a special dinner at the local pub, promising Paul a night to remember. 
she organize the children to stay with Paul's mother and then uh, arrange a night out for him. The date night comes at a time when Paul had confided to his friend he wants to end the marriage. I can remember him specifically saying that he wanted to figure out a way of parting company with Jacqueline, like going to a solicitor and seeing what his options were, etc. But Paul never gets the chance. CCTV footage captures Jacqueline and Paul leaving a bar at 1.23 a.m. Minutes later, as he enters the front door, he's ambushed. His assailant is Jacqueline's lover, Roger Ferguson. Between them, they beat and kick Paul senseless. They cut off his air supply with a plastic bag. Jacqueline told Paul he's worth more dead than alive. Now she makes it come true. So she can cash in his life insurance policies for a new life with her lover. Insurance companies aren't that stupid. They don't write big checks to beneficiaries that were murdered. They do their own investigation. Time after time, greedy people think that's all there is to it, but they almost always get caught. Roger drives the body away in the family car and dumps it on an isolated road. Jacqueline stages a robbery and then ties her hands together to play the victim. The scene is set. She calls the police. When Jim McFarlane hears the news from a police officer, he immediately suspects Jacqueline. I said to him without any hesitation, she's got something to do with this. Straight up, I know. Because this guy's too nice, doesn't do anything wrong. She's definitely got something to do with this. Jacqueline was giving out enough signals for her victim's best friend to connect her to the crime. Jim was a good friend. He'd encourage Paul to leave his wife, and Paul was developing a plan. It was just too late. Luckily, Jacqueline doesn't cover her tracks very well. CCTV captures the Krimbles leaving the bar. It's a five-minute drive home, but Jacqueline doesn't make her call to emergency for another hour. She cannot explain the missing time. That's one of her weaknesses. She thinks she's smart, but she's not. Stupid people, they don't see how stupid they are, and their weakness is thinking that they're smarter than others. The police only have to ask the neighbors to find out about Jacqueline's not-so-secret affair. And the phone records reveal she made calls to Roger just before leaving the bar. She's a parasite to society. She killed a very good, hard-working, loving man and father of two children for money. Jacqueline Krimble is found guilty of murder and receives a life sentence with a 20-year non-parole period. Roger Ferguson is found guilty of murder and sentenced to life with an 18-year non-parole period. In these three cases and many others I've studied, love and money rarely live peacefully together. As my mother used to say, when you marry for money, you earn every penny. <laughs>